So good morning to all. It's a pleasure being with you. Government College Karnataka is a young college, and today most people talk in binaries, and therefore it's only natural that a young college should invite someone quite old to do a webinar for them. So thank you, Dr. Rajalakshmi, and the principal, Dr. Jayasree, for the kind words of welcome. Now I'll go a little fast because I have just forty-five minutes at hand. Now I'll just begin by mentioning my title. My title is Theatre Theory and Praxis. So my focus was, would basically be on the Greek word theatron, which means a place to see, and theomai, the act of seeing. So the talk would probably focus only on the space of the theatre, and not the literature, dramas, or plays, which would constitute a very large canvas. The second part, theory, becomes important because theory usually comes after drama. In fact, Aristotle brought out his poetics three hundred years after the dramas were already there. And I want to see how the theater, how the space of the theater was used, misused, improvised. And subverted by various theatre practitioners on the stage. By praxis, I mean the process of performance, putting a theatrical method into practice, acting, and actors constitute the backbone of praxis. Hence. I propose to have a brief look also at some of the acting theories. So please bear in mind, theatre is not a literary art. It relies on acting, singing, dancing, spectacle, and aspects of production. Now, first of all, before going into the talk. I would like to set an ambience, or rather, I would like to contextualize my talk by using or taking the help of ten snippets. You can call them snippets, or you can call them scenes, or you can call them trivia. I hope when I finish these ten snippets, I would have created a stage. From where I can launch into my topic proper. I want all of you to journey back to the Greek theatre, and now you all know. Only the Greek theatre at Epidaurus, which was established in the third or fourth century, is still maintained. I just want you to imagine that the Epidaurus theatre had first only. Thirteen rows for audience, and then it was made into sixteen. And the characters, as you know, would stand in the center and perform. And the audience who sat on the thirteenth row, if they turn back, they could see the whole landscape around them. And the actors, while performing. Now everybody talks about the one eighty degree angle in cinema, but you understand that the actors of the day, in fact, performed in the three sixty degree angle. So you have to communicate with everyone, and in the process, the actor was juxtaposing himself with the landscape and the space around, and his voice, tone. Body language, architecture, acoustics, 
active. All these collaborated. And there was a merging between the actor and the audience and the landscape, which actually turned into a sort of juxtaposition for the stage inside. My second snippet, I want to take you to the Elizabethan stage. Everybody knows about the Elizabethan stage, but I just want you to have a look at something different. There are studies which say, which say that while the play was being performed in the Shakespearean stage, sometimes ugly, ugly smell would waft into the auditorium. Because sometimes you had the heads of certain peoples or rebels cut and planted in the outskirts of the theater. And this smell would waft into the theater. It was actually a sort of warning. It was very political. There is an establishment, a contrast between the comfy interior and the violent exterior. The third snippet I want you to take a look at was an incident that happened in 1758. It was the age of Rousseau, the champion of enlightenment. And in 1758, there was a plan to establish a theater in Geneva. And then the great Rousseau wrote a letter to Jean de Alembert. He opposes the establishment of the theater because he believes that it is a threat to ideal life. It can be dangerous for the innocent. You have to be very careful because comedies are sometimes poison in disguise. The manipulative acting on the stage may be sometimes transferred to life and it is not good for the poor. Just imagine the champion of Renaissance, Rousseau, writing a letter to prevent the establishment of a theater in Geneva. You can imagine the impact of the theater by now. The fourth snippet is the journey of Stanislavski and his Moscow art theater to the US. And after many performances in the US by Stanislavski's Moscow art theater group, the US actors and directors and theater people came to the conclusion that here was a new form of theater, a new form of acting. And therefore, some of the great dramatists and drama theorists of the day, like Lee Strasberg, Sanford Meissner, and Adler, they started adopting many of the theories of Stanislavski and also decided to establish drama and acting schools in the US. So the entrance of Stanislavski into the US drama landscape, I believe, is very, very important. The fifth snippet is about the Czechoslovak and dramatist Vaklik Havel. He is one person who incorporated the element of drama and politics and resistance into his writing. And many of his plays were banned in Czechoslovakia. But the impact was so strong that later he became the president of Czechoslovakia. So the protest writings of Vaclav Havel becomes very important in the evolution of the theater. The sixth snippet, around 1950, you have a young 
researcher. Roaming around many cities around the world and watching many plays. And after watching these plays, he comes to the conclusion that these plays have something in common. And the plays he watched are those of Samuel Beckett, Alby, Ionesco, Pinter, etc. And in 1961, he published the work, The Theatre of the Absurd. And you should understand when Beckett's Waiting for Godot was first performed in Paris, after half an hour, the curtains had to be brought down. Then the play traveled to London and the play could not be completed. But then Beckett and his team traveled to the US. And in a jail, it was performed between, before 1,400 spectators. And it became a hit. So my snippet tries to argue that this avant-garde movement of absurd drama and its role in manipulating the theater is very great. My seventh snippet, I want to come down to India. I want you to have a look at the Nati Shastra. Everyone considers the Nati Shastra as the fifth Veda. Bharada, it is believed that with his hundred sons and the celestial dancers, performed the first play. It was very pleasing and edifying. It was actually meant for the gods. But then what happened is, in between the play, there was a conflict between the demons and the gods, and it is believed that the gods won. But this victory led to a battle between the demons and He tells the demons, the drama has three worlds in it. It is spiritual, it is secular, it is sensuous. And it has every emotion inside it. But we still do not know whether the performance was complete and successful. I propose to argue that in every performance, there is a risk of failure, there is disruption, there is violence, and also the viewer response can alter any artistic event. The eighth snippet is about the great British Shakespearean actor Lawrence Olivia. Lawrence Olivier has a wonderful book called On Acting, in which there is a chapter on preparing for Othello, uh, where he says, when he was offered the role of Othello, he was surprised. A black moon, how can a white man like me do it? And then he tells us how he prepares for the role. He understands that Othello is a man who has a rough exterior, but a very soft interior. He's very strong. So he decides to develop a voice that is silvery and deep blue. It's velvety because it will show the emotions. Deep blue, it is very intense. And then how should Othello walk? He should walk like a walking. See? This is a wonderful example of an actor's preparation for a performance. Forgive me if I use two words. Curtsy, Thomas School, Paradigm Shift, and Bacalod's 
epistemological break. I'm not sure if these uh, loaded words are necessary, but I feel that the year 1900 is very important in the evolution of theater. Because by 1900, you have two technologies emerging very strongly. One is photography and the other is film. Now, with the coming of these two, there was no need of realism anymore because the film and photography had already explored all the possibilities of film, of realism. And therefore, everyone was ready to experience. And therefore, this is a point where there is a break with realism. And this led to experimentation and divergence in theater. And my last snippet, the 10th one. In the 1850s, when excavations were held inside the pyramids in Egypt, one pyramid revealed something very strange. On the walls of the pyramid inside, you had dialogues written. It was about the god Osiris. And today, academics have come to the conclusion that even a depth chamber was a place where you had drama being performed. Unknowingly, even in the next world, there was the accompaniment of drama. I hope I have contextualized myself with these 10 snippets. They are random selections, no chronology, I agree, but I hope I have set the tone in motion. Now, when you speak about the stage, basically it's very simple. If you look at the architecture of the stage or the structure of the stage, you can divide the structure or the pattern or the architecture of the stage into five or seven types, basically, which I'll just fly over. You can think of the arena stage, which is considered to be the earliest, where people sat around and the rituals were held. And these rituals sometimes took on the possibility of narratives, how the boar was hunted, how the lion was hunted, etc. These stories would be narrated and people would sit in circles and this was the earliest form of the arena stage. Then you have the proscenium stage, which evolved in the Roman period. You don't have to explain much. The proscenium stage is something like a college auditorium where you have the stage and the aud uh, audience sitting in front. Then you have the thrust stage. The stage projects into the audience. It's very common in Greek and Elizabethan theater. The audience becomes very close to the actors. Then you have the black box stage, where a room is painted fully in black. And the director or the producers or the theater people decide where the audience should be, where the actors, etc., et should be, because the whole room is painted black. The stage can be set anywhere, the audience can sit anywhere. Then you have found spaces. The stage can be anywhere, it can be in the cathedral. It can be in the warehouse. It can be on the streets. Where you perform, it is a stage. It's called the found stage. You find it. Then you have the hippodromes in the 20th century. They are large halls, well-lighted, great showpiece. You have performance inside hippodromes. Then you have the platform stage where 
the platform is projected into the audience like a ramp. That also helps in interaction between the audience and the actors. Then, of course, you have the open air or the experimental stage. But one should understand that these are just physical spaces. The magic of performance transforms these spaces. Now, I'll go to my next level. I want to look at certain schools of theater which through their performances, theories, etc., have transformed the theater, have transformed the stage, and also transformed dramas and plays into new realms and new perspectives. For this also, I'll be using a random pick. I'll not be looking at the dates. Because I'm doing this webinar in Kerala, I would like to begin by sharing a small anecdote. In Kerala, we have the great drama theoretician and dramatist, Professor G. Shankarapale. Now, he has a wonderful story to tell. One day, he was invited as a judge in an amateur drama competition. So the drama, third drama that was presented there, the play was going on and in front of the stage, you had a rope tied and one young man was standing there and showing a lot of violent actions. As a judge, he did not understand what it was, but he kept that in mind. So when the prizes were announced, this drama had no price. And then the drama youngsters, the amateur group, they came to him and asked him, sir, the third drama was ours, but we thought it was good. We have no prizes. So he said, yes, yes, yes. I was waiting to ask you, what was the meaning of the violence that was shown in the front? And with a sly smile, one of the boys said, sir, that was theater of cruelty. And that was a new lesson for Professor Shankarapu. So I think I'll begin my drama theory schools with the theater of cruelty. The theater of cruelty, in fact, became strengthened with the publication in 1938 of the book, The Theater and Its Double, by the theorist Antonin Artaud. Now, he started off as a surrealist under the influence of Dadaism and Salvador Dali. He started off as a surrealist. But then he happened to see a Balinese dance performance. A Balinese troupe was performing, and he happened to see the dance. And this made him think that here was a communion between actor in a magic exorcism. It was a sort of exorcism. The gestures, the sound, the unnatural scenery, all this was a sort of subverting of the realistic. And he believed that only if you showed such violent actions on the stage, the spectator can see the baseness, the ugliness, the meanness of the world. And he wanted to abolish the stage, even the auditorium. And it is unfortunate that the theater of cruelty stage did not have a long life because of its anarchic stance in the case of theater. And it is believed that he could only produce one play, the Chenchi of Shelley, during his lifetime. So the second theater I want you to look at 
is the living theater. It was established in 1947 by two women, Judith Melina and Julian Beck. Now, there were two nurses. And today, most people believe that they should be called the originators of the feminist theater. They had their place during the beat generation. And they also approached the theater in an avant-garde style. It was a minimalist theater with no excesses. They performed in streets, in prisons, and they believed in cooperative communal expression. And their only intention was subverting and transforming power and hierarchies. The third drama movement, I want you to look at this, called the Panic Movement. Panic Movement, which was established in 1962 by three people called Arabel, Jodrowski, and Roland Topa. The Panic Theater was actually named after the god Pan. It is chaotic and surreal. On the theater, on the stage, you have scenes like slitting of the throat of the geese. You have naked women covered in honey. You have a crucified chicken. And you have a giant vagina on the stage. So this surreal act the chaotic act is shown on the stage. You cannot move forward without, although it's very knowledgeable, it's so stale, but you cannot move forward without looking at the absurd theater. Now, when Martin Eslin started writing about the absurd theater, he has a wonderful quote. I'll just read that out for you. If a good play must have a cover, cleverly constructed story, these have no story or plot to speak of. If a good play is judged by subtlety of characterization and motivation, these are often without recognizable characters and present the audience with almost mechanical puppets. If a good play is to have a fully explained theme which is neatly exposed and finally solved, these often have neither a beginning nor an end. If a good play is to hold the mirror up to nature and portray the manners and mannerisms of the age, as is finally observed, these seem often to be reflections of dreams and nightmares. If a good play relies on witty repartee and pointed dialogue, these often consist of incoherent babblings. This is a quote from Martin Eslin's Theater of the Absurd. Now, you all know that the absurd dramatists, they were influenced by the existential theories of Albert Camus and Sartre. Life has no meaning. All communication has broken down. Everything is irrational and illogical. And therefore, it is only natural by showing that pattern, you can communicate the existential angst of modern man. You cannot have a romantic pattern to communicate the existential. It is very important for the pattern and the philosophy to match. And therefore, they had repetitive, meaningless cliches, wordplay, nonsenses, etc. in their plays. And they dismissed the concept of the well-made play, which was made popular by the writer and theorist Eugene Scribe. They did not believe in that. Dramatists like Ionesco, Adamov, Beckett, Jean Genet, Pinter. Pinter, in fact, created a sub-theater in the absurd. 
which he called the theater of menace. The, the world was menacing. He has this wonderful argument that my plays are like weasels under the cocktail cabinet. They constantly irritate you, provoke you. And there are some critics who argue that even in Malayalam, you have examples and influences of the absurd theater. For example, Ennan Pillai has two plays, Amaram and Kudumba Samedam. And G. Shankara Pillai wrote plays like Raksha Purishan and Tirumbi Vandran Tambi, which had influences of the absurd theater. To sum up the absurd, you can say, the absurd dramatists and the absurd theorists, in fact, they wanted to bring down the fourth wall. That is the audience. You have three walls, and the fourth wall is the audience. The absurd dramatists wanted to bring down the fourth wall. And the absurd theater, although it was considered nonsensical, it is believed that it uncovers the precipice under everyday practice. It is provoking and it questions many of the tenets of conventional theater and stage and becomes very important. The next school I'm going to is the theater of the oppressed. Theater of the oppressed actually originated in Brazil in the 70s. It was started off by the theorist Augusto Boal, B-O-A-L, Augusto Boal. He was in fact influenced by the theories of Pablo Freire, especially his work, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You, you know the work where he describes modern education as banking education, where the teacher deposits information into the student and the student comes to the exam hall and uses a check as answers, etc. So these ideas of Pablo Freire influenced Augusta Boll, and he wrote plays which he believed would uplift the downtrodden, would give the oppressed certain rights, and he has this curious way of uh, splitting the word spectator into spect and actors. And he believes that it is very important to transform the reality in which these poor people are living. And his theater not only includes dialogues, but there's interaction and brainstorming as well. The next is image theater. This is a very strange type of theater where on the stage you have one actor who is a sculptor. And in the process of the play, he molds or he shapes one or more actors into statues. And this is done just by the process of touching. He touches, touches, and through the process, the people become statues. So you have the sculpture and the statue, the creator and the created on the stage, creating a special type of magic. Then you have the forum theater. This is another strange type of theater where you have the actors or audience interfering and stopping the performance if they feel that there is an element of oppression embedded in the performance. If there is something against women, if there is something against the poor, the audience or the actors themselves can intervene and break the flow of the performance and create 
a new text. Then there is the invisible theater. It is enacted in a place where people don't expect it at all. It can be in a street, it can be in a shopping center, etc. You can do that. Then there is a newspaper theater where the audience is encouraged to transform daily news articles into performances. This is done through the process of simple reading, closed reading, rhythmical reading, parallel reading, etc. The audience is encouraged to look at daily news articles, which is part of their daily life, and it is transformed into performances. Then there is a legislative theater or theater of transitive democracy, where you have real life legis legislators appearing on the stage and you have, have citizens engaging in performance and brainstorming with them. Then you have the playback theater, where audience tell stories and watch the actors improvise it on stage. Then there is the theater of poverty or the poor theater by the Russian theorist Grotovsky. There's this famous story which he himself narrates. One day he was setting the stage to perform a play by Chekhov. So he was, he was planning a garden on the sets and then his young son runs by spoiling the set and the father gets very angry. It's a garden, and the son, uh, boy says, but Papa, this is a real garden. This set him thinking, and he comes up with the idea of the poor theater or the theater of poverty, where performance tries to get rid of excesses, lavish costumes, detailed sets, etc. That is minimal property. It is actually minimalist theater. The skill of actors becomes very important. The actor has to demonstrate the properties on the set through his or her acting potential. The actor's mental and physical senses are used to reveal the core of the character. In fact, Grotowski had come to Kerala and his journeys to China. He himself agrees that the Peking Opera and the Kathakali of Kerala have influenced his concept of the poor theatre. Then you have the documentary of political theatre of Irvin Piscat, where documents themselves are projected into the text and performance. And these performances have an objective, a declared purpose and a factual purpose. Then you have the total theater or the theater of the future, which is propounded by Edward Gordon Craig, C-R-A-I-G. During his lifetime, he was considered to be an eccentric. But today, most of his ideas have become very prophetic. He avoided historical and archeological scenography and unimaginative use of lighting. He believed in simplicity of costume, setting, lighting, movement, etc. And his chance encounter with a great dance use, Isadora Duncan, was very vital because he was fascinated by the pure movement of Isadora Duncan. And this led him to various experiments and he brought in the concept of the moving stage. He believed that the stage and the settings there, if it could be moved, it could create emotions on its own. His, during his day, it was considered not at all practical. But today, many people with the coming of 
technologies like graphics, etc. The theories of Edward Gordon Gregg have gained importance. 1910-1924 is a very important period in Germany because Germany was suffering from the ill effects of the First World War. And the youth in Germany were very disappointed, very upset. And all this was reflected in the family. And a special school of philosophy, of thought, of drama, of writing, projected itself, which later came to be called Expressionism. It was very strong in painting and drama. When you hear the word expressionism itself, you get the image of the painting of Edward Monk, the screen. You can define expressionism as a subjective account of a subjective perception. It is very self-centered. The world is crammed into one man's vision. One critic goes on to say, expressionist art and theater is an efflorescence of the inner self. It's a flowering of the inner self. There is lyricism of language. Some people call it the theater of ecstasy. It's an ecstatic theater. In fact, Bertolt Brecht's epic theater, you can say, is a subtext of expressions. It is in this epic theater that Bertolt Brecht creates the idea of Wolfram Dung's effect or the alienation effect, where he claims that the audience should come out of the theater as if they have seen a football match, not as if they have had a heavy lunch. That means even after the performance, you should be thinking. And if this should happen, there should not be any empathy between the characters and the audience. If there is empathy, if the heroine cries, the audience also cries, the idea falls flat. So, it is this context that Brett introduced the idea of the alienation effect. He believed that the audience and the actors should not empathize. There should be alienation between them. Only then the idea of the play would be transferred in the right way. So, so you, you, he uses many techniques in the theater, like using placards, uh, and sometimes the actor performing a role when he has nothing to do on the stage, he comes and sits with the audience and introduces himself by his real name, thereby breaking the iconic status of the actor. So all these techniques are used by him in the epic theater and the stage becomes a place of experiment. It becomes a place for ideology. It becomes a place for politics. And it also becomes a place for propaganda. Then you have the promenade stage. Where the audience stand and watch. Watching the action happening among them. The action would be happening among them and the audience would watch. And even follow the performers around in the performance space. So it becomes a microcosm of a street or a village or a market or even the world because the audience and the actors are so engaged and engrossed in themselves. With the coming of light technology and lighting, you have the evolution of the transparent theater, especially in the US. It would be a large stage. For example, if you take the case of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. When you see it on the transparent stage, 
all characters are working through the process of lighting. For example, when the play opens, when Lohman enters the house, Linda is asleep. So Linda wakes up on her table, on her bed, and asks, are you there? So when Linda is talking, there is light in the space where Linda is. So when there is a response from Lohman, there is light near low man and all the others fade out. And when the mother and father talk and in the other room, Biff and Happy are, are listening to them. And when they start talking, the light goes to them. And so the whole stage becomes very transparent through the process of lighting. And this lighting creates a personal space. It is not an interactive merging space. And very strangely, knowingly or unknowingly, the transparent stage takes on an impressionist style because impressionism is about the specificities of light on objects and places. Now we cannot go forward without touching Peter Brook. Now, I think it's already, I'll, I'll be running now. Um, Peter Brook. Peter Brook had a close collaboration with Salvador Dali. And people often think of Peter Brook as a person who dramatized the Mahabharata in seven hours. It was a multi-race or multi-country cast. You even had Panchali was performed by the Indian actress. And he spoke about the performer's internal relationships, performer's relationship with each other and relationship with the audience. He argued that you give me any place, I would make that into a stage. I would also make a brief mention about Wackler Havel, who through his plays was able to create green politics and its awareness on the stage. Dario Fo, the Italian dramatist, who played with conventions and canons. His dramatizations of Hamlet and Othello, he has created an albino Othello. And Hamlet, the relationship between Hamlet, his father, mother, are all jinxed in his place. Then I'll run through a few fringe theater movements. You have the immersive theater, where the actors and audience share a common space and property, and there is even co-creation between the audience and the characters, which was introduced by Robert Whitman. Then you have the foundry theater. That's again a strange experiment. The theater or the theater space would be in say chartered buses. Then Berlin, you have the experiments of Rimini protocol, where the audience are given cell phones and they are guided. And they have to follow the guidance of the guide and discover the play somewhere. And then you have, I'll stop this section by making a brief mention of Richard Churchner and Victor Turner, who are very famous with their performance studies. The performance studies started off with their seminar on ritual, drama, and spectacle. These uh, Sheshna and Turner claim that every performance has certain duties. One, to entertain, to create beauty, to mark or change identity, to make or foster community, to heal, to teach or persuade, to deal with the sacred 
and the demonic. So, I think I'll jump from here and go to the next section very fast. Whatever happens in the theater, there has to be performance. And in order to have performance, you need actors. So I'll just look at a few theories associated with acting and actors. The theorist James Lipton speaks of a reverie approach in acting. He considers the acting or the scope of acting or the act of acting is like approaching the altar or the church. The famous actress Meryl uh, Streep has expatiated on this when she says, it is like entering a zone. It's a reverie. It's a meditation. Julia Kristeva says acting has an anaphoric function. It is like her concept of intertextuality. An actor refers back to others and other ideas. Richard Dyer argues that there are five styles of acting, which is the vaudeville or the music hall type of acting. The second is the melodramatic type of acting. Then the Hollywood studio acting, Broadway acting, and the method acting. Now I'll come to some of the main schools of acting, which includes the classical acting style, and which was basically propounded by the theorist Stanislavski. Now Stanislavski focuses on the body, the voice, imagination, and personalizing, and he calls it the method act. There is improvisation, there is the help of the external stimuli, and there is script analysis. Some of his actors take one month to study a script. He speaks about the plasticity of the body, and every actor should experience the role before the portrayal. And it's the duty of every actor to understand the intent or the super objective of the dramatist. He questions the concept of identification with the role. He says identification is actually pathological. There's nothing like identification. He has this method of physical actions, organized emotion. The actors draw upon their own feelings and experiences and internalize the characters. And he calls this concept also public solitude. Along with Stanislavski, you have Lee Strasberg who also was a part of the group theater. He argued, along with Stella Adler and Sanford Meissner, that it's very important for the actor to have emotional and cognitive understanding of their roles. The actors should use their own experiences to identify personally with their characters. Actors should substitute emotions drawn from past experiences and create a private moment. The psychophysical approach was theorized by Michael Cheko. He said, the artist or the actor should ignore the banal things of daily life. And the actors should go to the unconscious, should go to the level of the unconscious, where there are universal and archetypal images. And then come to the process of acting through a sort of meditation. And you know some of those famous film actors like Jack Nicholson 
and Clint Eastwood, Merlin Monroe, Yul Brenner, they were all students of Lee Strasberg. The Meissner technique, which is very complicated and complex, the actor focuses on the other actor and think they only exist in that moment. Acting is a response to other people and circumstances. It is very important for the actor to get out of their head. It should be very intuitive and impulsive response to the other actor. The Meissner techniques are very complex. One character tells a line, the other repeats it, and they go on repeating to each other the same line, and they reach a point when they understand the meaning of the response. And then you have the Brechtian style of acting, which is very popular in epic drama, where the actor has to develop this concept of reflective detachment, not emotional involvement. Then you have the theories of Meyerhold and his theories of biomechanics. He argues that the actor could call up emotion in performance by practicing and assuming poses, gestures, and moments. The physicality of all these should be exercised, prepared, and practiced, and his physical states can then be understood. Now a quick look at theories. I'll be running now, it's, time is going by, I know. Um, if you take new criticism, new criticism sees every play or a drama has an autonomous artifact. It is there, everything is inside the play. Marxism speaks of the theater of commitment. And they in fact don't encourage interdisciplinary and experimental, and they're quite skeptical about it. They want the theater to be committed. They want it to be in the pattern of socialist realism. If you come to structuralism and semiotics, one should see the play as well-structured, well-made, but semiotics starts studying the signs of theater, of the stage, the language used, the property used, the misa sin that is there on the stage, the space, the costume, all that are seen as signs and are studied by the semiotations. In post-structuralist or postmodern play, as in theory, you have this concept of free play, open-endedness in play. There is fragmentation, there is paranoia, there is language disorder, all that entering into the ambit of the play and in the stage. You can, in simple terms, the postmodern play and the postmodern stay is, stage is always engaged in the act of free play. If you come to reception aesthetics, if you take the theories of Iser and Jaws, you will have to argue that the audience is an interpretive community. The audience is seated in the theater with a horizon of expectations. And it becomes very important for the actors to know the audience and the audience to know the actors. In fact, there is a uh, American play by Clifford Audit called Waiting for Lefty. It's a propagandist play. And while the play is on, uh, a character comes onto the stage and asks, what shall we do? What shall we ever do? And then the audience unknowingly says, strike, strike. This was there at the first show, but wherever they went with the show, this started continually happening because the horizon of expectations was being fulfilled. So this reception aesthetics and the emancipated spectator are very important in reception aesthetics theory and drama. Then if you come to feminism, you have the women's theater group 
in Britain, and you have them performing a play like Lear's Daughters. In post-colonialism, you have diaspora and hybridity theatres engaging themselves in manipulating and improvising with the stage. In cultural studies, and when you take mass culture, you find that the plays today are performing the everyday. They are connecting the marginalized and they are raising questions of hegemony. Now I started off with 10 snippets. Now I will end with three snippets. One. Now, even today in Europe, in places like Spain and Germany and UK, you have these passion plays, which is very popular in the medieval period, the passion plays based on the sufferings of Christ being performed in large areas. And the beauty of this, it is that the whole landscape becomes a canvas because it is performed on a large scale. And this canvas looks like a Renaissance painting. Therefore, we can argue even the ancient performance of the Passion Play, you can see the landscape as an artistic and ritualistic mindscape. My second snippet is in the Nigerian Igbo community and the Yoruba theater. Their theater, the Yoruba theater, is very colorful. It's a spectacle in colorful dresses, property, and they're constantly moving on the streets. And if you have a panoptic vision of the spectacle, you will see that the flora and the fauna is being impersonated. The vibrations of nature are slowly palimpsested into the play or into the spectacle of the Aruba theater. And my third snippet, I want to manipulate or subvert an idea of Deleuze and Guitar. Deleuze has this idea of the rhizome. My argument is that the stage develops or evolves not just like a tree. It also evolves or develops or grows like a rhizome. And therefore, unlike the tree, we are not sure from where to where and when. Theater is here and there. It's everywhere. And we should ask ourselves, who are its performers? Thank you very much.